Sorry? Only give urine output. Urine output is on the lower side. Okay, when there is no urine output, when there is anuria, then? Electrolyte disturbances. Electrolyte disturbances, which includes everything, okay? It's not, when you say electrolyte disturbances, it's not related to hypothalamia alone. Right from hypothalamia to hypernatrium to hypercalcemia to hypermedicine, everything. Okay, everything comes in to the replacement. The final pathway remains the fact that the kidney isn't working, so you need something to get that up. Then? Sorry? Toxicity. Drug toxicity. toxicity, okay. So remove some toxins basically. Okay, that is also one part. Refractory okay. acidosis. Refractory acidosis. Refractory acidosis then. Ammonia, ammonia not, very, not very, but ammonia. Okay, very, very rare. Okay, then. Refractory pulmonary edema. Refractory pulmonary edema, yeah. So pulmonary edema. So in short, what you basically said is either when there is too much of water or there is too less clearance or when there is too much of toxicity. There are three things that come in the place. Okay, either too much of water, too much of uh, toxicity, or too much of um, uh, uh, electrolyte disturbances that come in that basically causes uh, uh, reason for renal replacement therapy. It's always been uh, we we at the moment apart from knowing this much that hyperkalemia, the life-threatening hyperkalemia, is a clear-cut indication for renal replacement therapy. The rest we are not certain. The rest is all clinical. Ones. As of now, we know for certain that if the potassium is aided and the patient is arresting or patient is going to bradycardia uh, and there is anuria, then the only treatment is, uh, is renal replacement therapy or any form of modality which should remove potassium out. You know, apart from this no, the timing, when, why, what, we don't know. You, you, you understand? So we are, we are still learning as to what we should do with renal replacement therapy. Broadly, we are clinically doing things over here. Okay, so let's go to renal replacement therapy. So the principles of RRD, there are mainly two principles, water removal and solute removal. Water removal, uh, the process is called as ultrafiltration. It is achieved by creating a transmembrane pressure which is greater than the plasma oncotic pressure or by increasing the osmolarity of dialysis. Then solute removal. Uh, it occurs by either diffusion or convection. So when she says this, when she's saying this, you go back to water removal. Anymore. So anytime water is removed from your body, anytime, there are three pressures that are working. Which are the three pressures? Oncotic pressure. Osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. Three pressure होते हैं. Okay. So even why you must remember this principle is because even when you are dealing with CRRT as a as a modality or any kind of modality CBBH flow, CBHD flow, scuff flow, you should understand that it's these three modalities that are working. One is osmotic pressure, oncotic pressure, and hydrostatic pressure, which is responsible for water removal. Okay. Huh? And so for solute removal, you are actually going to deal with either diffusion or with convection. That's why the principles are important. Okay, so solutes are different, water is removed. Water is water. What is solute? Solute is everything else other than water. Everything else other than water. When you say solute, it can be albumin, inulin, microglobulin, myoglobulin, it can be sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, it could be anything. You understand that is solute. Urea, creatinine, they are the, they are the solutes. Are you, are you understanding? Whereas when you say water, it's, it's water in your body which has to come out. So water, hydrostatic, osmotic and oncotic pressure, whereas when you look at solute removal, it is diffusion or it is convection. Clear? With this you must remember, okay? Huh? So uh, we will understand this by the two diagrams. Uh, first is convection, there is a pressure gradient is there. <coughs> whole low molecular and middle molecular weight uh, substances along with the water they will go uh, on the opposite side of the semi permeable membrane and the ultrafiltrate will be removed. Then second is the uh, diffusion. In diffusion what we do will uh, infuse dialysis solution so the filtration will occur by against the concentration gradient means uh, high toxic substances will uh, they will the concentration will be higher on this side and the lower concentration will be on this side so the concentration gradient will be there so the indications for RRT so indications are oliguria when urine output is less than 200 uh, ml for 12 hours anuria when output is less than uh, 50 ml or 0 to 50 ml per 12 hours urea more than 35 millimol per litre create more than 400 micromol per litre serum potassium more than 6.5 pulmonary edema unresponsive to diuretics uncompensated metabolic acidosis 
sodium uh, concentration hyper or hyponatremia then uh, temperature above 40 degrees then uremic complications like encephalopathy myopathy neuropathy pericarditis or overdose with the toxins then uh, modalities there are different modalities uh, we use uh, they are uh, peritoneal dialysis, <coughs> intermittent hemodialysis then continuous renal replacement therapy and hybrid therapy that combines both ISD and CRRT so the criteria for the selection of modalities are uh, the modalities will be selected based on the hemodynamic side effects ability to control uh, fluid status, biocompatibility risk of infection, uremia control avoidance of cerebral edema ability to allow full nutritional support ability to control acidosis absence of specific side effects and the cost then first is peritoneal dialysis uh, this is uh, what we use uh, we will use 1.3 to 5 liter of dialysis solution uh, into the peritoneal cavity and allow to dwell for a set period of time usually 2 to 4 hours the rate of diffusion diminishes with the time and eventually stops when equilibration between the plasma and dialysis is, is reached so but uh, we are using this method uh, uncommonly nowadays because uh, higher risk of peritonitis catheter associated complication unpredictable hyperglycemia it occurs due to because the solution contains sugars uh, fluid leaks perit uh, protein loss and interference with diaphragm function this is the diagram here we are infusing dialysis solution into the peritoneal cavity and this is the effluent and the waste products will cross the semi permeable membrane <coughs> into the peritoneal space but there are certain benefits of uh, this peritoneal dialysis it is the uh, yeah, flexible with lifestyle better quality of life patient can even drive with peritoneal catheter in situ so so peritoneal dialysis have you all seen this any time so peritoneal dialysis what does it involve it involves a catheter in the first place okay there is a catheter that is put inside the body it's put near the peritoneum okay and the peritoneum behaves like the semi permeable membrane the, it is a peritoneum that behaves like a semi permeable membrane what happens over there is you just leave some amount of water inside huh? and then after 4 liters you just after 2.5 uh, liters go inside you wait for around 3 to 4 hours 2 hours 3 hours 4 hours and then you just drain this fluid out simple it's very simple okay so if you go in, in the in the trains and all you might have people sitting with a catheter uh, and then wo, when they are getting off the train after 2 hours they will drain it out it's as simple as that okay it's not difficult at all so as she rightly said it actually affords a very flexible lifestyle I mean very very flexible lifestyle a person can do whatever he wants to do without any problem and continue doing his work however it is not very efficient it is not very efficient so it's not it's not quick there is always chances of problems occurring with respect to infection inside the body because after all there is a catheter in the peritoneum so in which patients you can't use it it is obvious that you can't use it in patients who got intra abdominal tuberculosis and infections and things like that you can't use it on those cases Okay, so at the moment we are not using much of this because our advanced dialysis are much more easier, uh, much more easier to do. It's two hours or two and a half hours. You're completing all the whole whole program, and it's very easy to do dialysis as of now. Okay, uh, right. Next is intermittent hemodialysis. It is a process in which blood and dialysate are perfused on <coughs> the opposite side of the semi permeable membrane. The solute are removed predominantly by the diffusion. As we said, uh, diffusion, that uh, method of solute removal, we use diffusion. D for diffusion, D for dialysis. Last. Then um, it is commonly used as a chronic RRT for patient with end stage renal disease and typically performed three times a week. For patient with AKI, it may be performed on daily basis. Uh, ISG is not preferred in hemodynamically unstable patient because the high clearance with resultant decrease in plasma osmolarity, short treatment time during which the volume can be removed that can result in decreased blood volume. So this is the picture. Uh, so we are using a diffusion method. So uh, dialyzer, uh, the blood will be removed and roller, it will go to the roller pump, dialyzer solution is there. Then filtered blood will again go back to the patient. So, so, so in intermittent hemodialysis, what have you understood? That it is first of all a very short term therapy, isn't it? It's a very, very short term therapy. So, when you do intermittent hemodialysis, it's basically approximately 3 hours, 2 hours to 4 hours is what 
this intermittent hemodialysis lasts for. Okay, the entire principle is based on dialysis, but that doesn't mean you don't do ultra filtration. Dialysis itself, uh, when you do a dialysate, a dialysis, uh, you can actually do an ultra filtration at the same time. That's why when you do intermittent hemodialysis, you also have diffusion as well as you have ultra filtration. Okay, so uh, dialysis will help to move solutes from uh, the solution of higher concentration to a solution of lower concentration. That is why classically the dialysate fluid, the dialysate, so how can you how can you take control of this therapy? In the first place you understand that there is a large amount of blood that is going to come out. Okay, and since there is going to be a large amount of blood that is going to come out, there is going to be hemodynamic instability. Okay, that is one of the reasons of hemodynamic instability that you are taking out blood from the body. The second reason of hemodynamic instability, can anyone tell me? The second reason of hemodynamic instability when you have intermittent hemodialysis. Because why am I asking you this question? Because tomorrow you have so many patients who are undergoing intermittent hemodialysis on a given day. You should be able to understand what is the reason that this patient is actually having a drop in blood pressure. Because if you don't know the reason, how will you correct it? When the nurse comes and asks you patients having uh, low blood pressure, how do you correct it? Then, then you should be able to understand what to do. So can you tell me? The rate at which the ultra filtrate is removed. Huh? The rate at which the uh, ultra filtrate is removed. So what is the difference between the CRRT and the intermittent? Uh, so one mistake that people normally do, one mistake that people normally do is, say you are uh, reached two hours of this of <coughs> hemodialysis and then suddenly you decide that the patient has got more fluid and you decide I want to increase the fluid the removal. So say your initial target was 1.5 liters. Say your initial target was 1.5 liters. Your dialysate was for a total period of around 3 hours. Say for example. Okay. So you had a session of HD. Give me another pen. Uh, in my room, I will open the drawer here. Huh? So say you have a dialysate. Uh, okay. Say for example you are you are you have given an order of UF of around. Uh, 1.5 liters and you have a dialysate and you have a dialysis order of 3 hours. So what is the order? 3 hours of dialysis and 1.5 liters of UF. Now you are on the rounds and, and, and as, as we do our rounds we actually see our patients who dynamically change. Now uh, we started the, we, we decided to start the uh, dialysis at 3 pm. Okay, 3 pm we started the dialysis and the orders were UF of 1.5 liters and the dialysis was for a total of 3 hours, say for example. Huh? So three. we started this at 3 o'clock and uh, you as one of the doctors in the ICU, you were actually figuring out what is happening to each patient because we don't complete the rounds. We, after our rounds, we start our rounds, it's usually that way. After our, uh, after our rounds, our rounds is just to understand the patient. After that, the entire time goes in what is happening now. You know, the entire time goes, I mean, rounds are not, we finish around 2 and 6 months, which is never that way. Rounds is just understanding, okay, today my patient is in this situation. I need to see him throughout the day. So when you are doing that throughout the day round, at 4 o'clock, 4 p.m., you figure out that this patient's saturation had dropped from 98 to 92%. And then you looked at the, uh, you decided uh, as a part of my evaluation to figure out my saturation, I actually auscultated the lungs. So I auscultated the lungs and I found that there were a large amount of crepitations that have developed over there. Okay, now you decided let me go ahead and figure out what is happening here. I did an ultrasound. I did an ultrasound. I found bilateral confluent B lines. Uh, bilateral confluent B lines. This means what? There's a large amount of fluid. This is as simple as that. So the the uh, nothing will deteriorate immediately unless uh, only fluid is the one that deteriorates a person immediately. An aspiration or a developing pneumonia will take time. Okay, so it is but logical that if the patient was at 98%, it has become 92% and patient has become breathless. Uh, the B lines over there are nothing but confluent B lines of fluid overload that you're seeing on, 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 your, uh, on your ultrasound. So the next step what you think in your mind is, oh, I have my dialysis going on, let me just increase my UF. Now what you do, at 4 p.m. you decided, let me make my UF uh, to uh, 4 liters. Now, uh, at 6 is at around 4, 5 p.m. Okay, you have only around one hour left. Okay, now what happens when you do this? When you do this, what happens is, it uh, at 6 p.m. you're going to stop your dialysis. Huh? That means another three liters is going to go out in one hour. Another three liters is going to go out in one hour. You, any patient you remove three liters in one hour, patient will collapse. Are you understanding? 
I got checked. So this is one of the commonest reasons. So what do you do at these stages? What would you think you should do? You have to increase the duration of the dialysis also. So you have to increase this to maybe eight, up to eight pm, nine pm, ten pm. Okay, and then keep the UF. You can't just say, "Chalo, four liter nikal do." That is a chalo ke four liter. Aisa nahi karte. Samajh mein aaye? Ha? So this is this is something that is very important for as a doctor. You must understand that removal of water, that is removal of ultrafiltrate, is one of the commonest causes of uh, of hypothalamic instability that occurs. So it all usually occurs like in the morning. You started dialysis at six a.m. The nephrologist walks in at seven, uh, eight a.m. And then uh, the nephrologist says, "Nee, one point five to three." <coughs> you are bedside. Nephrologist is not bedside. He will not realize. <coughs> okay. And then the dialysis gets shut off for some reason. Uh, that patient, you have that patient is going to definitely have hemodynamic instability. You understood it? What is the other cause of hemodynamic instability? What is the other cause? So that is one cause. So you know now that if a patient, you will avoid this. You will. It's a preventive cause. You know, it's very easy that you can prevent. And if it happens, you know what has happened really. Okay. Then. What is the other cause of hemodynamic instability? So electrolyte. No, here electrolyte is always going to get better only. Why is it going to get better? So sudden switch in the electrolytes. No. Electrolytes are here going to get better only. Mm -hmm. Electrolytes are going to happen to the electrolytes. It's getting it better because dialysate fluid has got electrolytes similar to that of the plasma. So if you have a dialysate that is there. The dialysate that dialysate is coming, the fluid water is coming. That water, that dialysate water, is actually having electrolytes absolutely similar to that of plasma. In fact, it will always be better because these electrolytes can be altered. Okay, so obviously it can be better, but otherwise uh, it is almost equivalent to that of the plasma. Clear on that? Clear on that? So electrolyte disturbances will not cause the patient to get hypotensive. We have question is why does the patient get hypotensive? Any so idea? Yeah, which which solution? Urea. 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 See, urea is a very highly osmotic solution. It actually contributes to your osmosis, right? Your osmolarity. When you look at the equation, two into sodium plus B U N, you know, plus C F three atoms. So blood urea and nitrogen actually corresponds to high osmolarity. That's why if you see patients of hypertensive emergency and they have E S R D, you see most of the end stage renal diseases have got very high blood pressures. They have very high blood pressures because the osmolar loads are also very very high apart from atherosclerosis that they already have. You understand? Huh? So one uh, situation is like for example we have the patient over there who is having hypertension. We are more and more dialyzing so because we want to remove more and more osmolarity from there. So she is now getting normal. She has become now kind of normal. So three four dialysis and she is going to get better. Her blood pressure is going to get better. Is what we assume. Similarly, when you have a patient with very high Uh, uh, the uh, the osmolarity and you dialyze them there is a possibility that the blood pressure is going to drop because you have reduced the osmolarity further then what is the other reason the so a speed or the blood it, it, so we normally the speed that they give see these these intermittent hemodialysis therapies are given for patients who are completely hemodynamically stable okay ha huh? if you're going to use this in patients who are going to be hemodynamically unstable Then the speed of the roller pump makes a big difference. Okay, the speed of the roller pump makes a difference. So if you go up to very high rates, classically 300, 400 ml per minute, okay, there is a possibility of hemodynamic instability to occur because you are removing fluid, uh, blood faster. It's the same thing. What I said, we are removing blood faster. Since we are removing blood out faster at a higher rate, there is bound to be a drop in uh, in the uh, in the blood pressure. Then another important part is the first time you are first undergoing dialysis, what happens? The first time you are undergoing dialysis, first time any patient undergoes dialysis, okay? Ah, huh? sorry. Reaction to foreign. Reaction to yes, foreign. yes, yes. yes. simple time. reaction to a foreign first body. Mm -hmm. So what is happening over here is you have a patient who has never been exposed to a dialysis, and the first time they want to undergo dialysis, you are taking it in the ICU. So what is going to happen over here? Uh, the moment you are going to move the blood from here to here, these membranes are actually artificial membranes. They can be an allergic reaction. There can be a severe allergic reaction that will drop the blood pressure majorly. Okay, so you should be careful that okay, this is and you know classically this will occur immediately. Classically, it will occur within some time. Within some time, not not like you have. It's going to take a while and then it is going to drop the blood pressure. It's going to take be immediate. So you'll immediately you will be press reaction. You will probably have an allergic reaction and the blood pressure will start dropping. Okay, so that is what you must remember. Then, then there is one electrolyte that causes a problem. That's hyponatremia. Okay, when there is the when there is a dialysate solution that has got very less amount of sodium. Okay, when when there is 
very less sodium. Okay, then the sodium approximation will not be okay. It fact will drive out the sodium, as she said. You know, so it drives out the sodium. Sodium being one of the very important part of osmolality, two into sodium, it will actually cause uh, problems over here. Right? Then another thing is if the solution is warm. Okay, if the solution there's a heater in this, yeah, and you keep it as warm. Okay, keep the dialysis at warm. There is a possibility that that will cause vasodilatation because it's warm. Okay, and that vasodilatation will actually cause the patient's blood pressure to drop. So there are multiple reasons why the blood pressure will drop in these cases. And in ICU, when there is a patient on prolonged dialysis on a field, on a on a dialysis cannula, what important causes sepsis? Okay, because what happens is the patient who comes in from outside, and the history will be classical. The history will be I undergo dialysis and I get fever. I undergo dialysis and I get chills. I undergo dialysis, rigors come in. At the end of dialysis, at the start of dialysis, in the, during the dialysis, after that I have no fever. Classically, we have a patient there at the moment. Okay, at the moment we have a patient there who comes with that particular history. It's important to note down that history. Okay, we have a patient there and we remove the catheter and now she has no fever. Uh, I understand because that also drops blood pressure. That can have a possibility of dropping blood pressure as a part of sepsis. Clear? Clear on this? Intermittent hemodialysis. So, which patients will you offer intermittent hemodialysis? Chronic patient, chronic insulin. What is the chronic? In the ICU? ICU, the patient hemodynamically stable. Right, but which is the indication? Real indication? Hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is a real indication because I want to remove the solute as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. That is the one that is causing death. That is the one that is causing death. So for, for a person who is in, uh, in uh, uh, hemodynamic uh, instability, of course, it's not something that I want to use. But in a person who has hyperkalemia, this is the modality that I will use. So okay. Acidosis. Acidosis. But remember this: whenever you have acidosis, these patients are classically going to be sick. They are classically going to be hypotensive. They are classically not going to be stable. Uh, you, you you understand? They are not those patients who will be sitting normally. You understand? So classically, the prime indication is usually hyperkalemia, where when there is going to be large amount of uh, <coughs> potassium which you need to take off quickly otherwise the patient can die. Now, so that is classically the indication for an intermittent hemodialysis session. That's why by the term intermittent it means short duration given you know thrice or twice a week typically uh, with a filter that, and, and a dialysate fluid. Right? And when you talk of dialysate fluid you must understand what is the meaning of dialysate fluid. Okay, how does this mechanism work? So if I were to draw a filter if I want to draw a filter, there are two kinds of filters. There are these cellulose filters and there are these synthetic filters. Okay, what are these filters? These filters classically are something that looks something very similar to this. It is like this. It's a filter, after all. And it has got fibers in it. It's got fibers in it. Okay, it's got fibers in it. So when she draws this, there are fibers in it. They are hollow circular fibers that remain like a hair. Like hair thin fibers are there inside in these filters. And what is happening is, you are actually sending blood and these are semi-permeable, you could call it as semi-permeable filters. You call it, let me make the holes over here. So you have semi-permeable filters to show you that there are you know, something like this. Now importantly, what we are uh, saying is that the blood is going from here, whereas dialysis is going from here. So if you look at it, blood is coming this way and dialysis is going this way. This is called counter current. It's called counter current. You understand? Counter current. Now, can you tell me why this is so? Why do you want to give it counter current? After all, you just want things to just approximate between two sides, right? So, why do you feel you should give it counter current? Why is the reason of being counter current? How? When I say keep it like this, what's what point are you going to develop on it? Even if you want to give it this way or this way. So, in counter current mechanisms, basically, when the flow goes outside, throughout there will be osmotic. So she's she's right. Now let me explain to you. What she says is absolutely right. Okay, there is going to be more effective diffusion when you are going to move these solutes and solution these solutions opposite to each other. Otherwise, that's so. Let's take the example of say I have a semi-permeable membrane. Okay, this is my membrane, for example. Okay, and and this is my blood. Okay, this is my blood. Okay, this is my blood. Okay, and this is my dialysate fluid. My dialysate fluid. Okay, now my dialysate fluid has got uh, very low amount of potassium, say for example, let's take the example of potassium. My blood has got a very, very high amount of potassium. Okay, now let me put this potassium to be very, very high amount. Okay, potassium very, very high amount. So I've got very high amount of potassium going from here. 
Huh? That is my blood. It's coming from here, so it's going for a very high amount. Now I'm putting my dialysate plate the other way around, where potassium is zero. Classically, now uh, zero K dialysis should not be done. Classically, unless there is life-threatening hyperkalemia, unless there is life-threatening hyperkalemia. So there also you don't give zero K dialysis all the time because the body's potassium will become zero. Are you, are you understanding? More the difference between the solutes, more the movement of the solutes. So, so dialysate can be modified. You can have 0k, you can have 2k, you can have 4k. You understand? 0k is like dangerous dialysis. Extremely dangerous dialysis. Why? Because the potassium will quickly move. I mean the potassium, you are at a rate of 200 and 300 ml per minute. So you are practically moving the blood very quickly. Okay, so when you are moving the blood very quickly, the potassium will become almost equal to zero, you know. You, you understand? So it's not something, it will become zero because it's going to move. It's not going to approximate, it's going to move. Are you understanding? Huh? So it can be quite disastrous and dangerous. You understand? So that is why classically, I'm going to go zero K karma. It should be only for an hour or maybe half an hour, maybe not more than that. Are you understanding? Similarly, when we are using CRRT, we don't give zero K. You give zero K, then the potential will become very, very low. Patient will have hypokalemia related arrhythmia and probably arrest also. Are you understanding? Huh? So I will give a small amount of potassium in that. So classically, these dialysate will have say very small amount of potassium. Okay, very small amount of Actually, what they have, they have calcium, they have magnesium, they have sodium, they have all these three things. The dialysate uh, fluid has got calcium, has got magnesium, has got sodium, it's got all three. And these proportions are very similar to what you have in your plasma. They're very similar to what you have in the plasma. The difference between creatinine and urea is not there. Okay, there is no creatinine and urea. And when you say small molecules, these are the small molecules. We just, she just mentioned small, middle and large molecules. What are the large molecules you know? Albumin, albumin, inulin, myoglobin, glucose, these are large molecules. These are large molecules. When I say large molecules, albumin, myoglobin, these are the large molecules. So if I'm going to do hemodialysis, my large molecules are not going to move. You understand? So I said, I said, you said that I'm dialysis and my protein is getting lost. It is not possible because those large molecules are not going to move. Do you Whereas in CRRT, no, there are no large molecules. Okay, there is a difference between the nutrition that you have in near dialysis versus you have in, in hemodialysis, in, in CRRT. So, so small, large molecules are? So tomorrow if I have rhabdomyolysis, I can't do it, I, can't, I may have to do something like CRRT. Because it's got large molecule clearance. So, huh? And when I say large molecule means it's going to actually physically move. That's what it means, large molecule physically move. But when I say middle molecules, it's the rest, you know, the smaller ones that are coming in. Aluminium and things like that. And then when you say small molecules is what you are actually concerned with. Glucose, uh, urea, creatinine, potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium. These are the small molecules. Clear? Huh? So these uh, middle molecules, also these ones, the cytokines, interleukins, interleukin 1, 6, alpha. These are all middle molecules. Okay, so tomorrow if you want to get the patient of sepsis, uh, I want to clear more middle molecules. I want to get sure that more middle molecules pass. And you rightly said in the earlier slide <coughs> that small molecules are independent hemodialysis, whereas middle molecules are CRRD. It's more of CRRD. Middle and large. Middle, CRRD is everything. Small, medium and large. Right? Huh? Clear on this? So now, now when I go from here, now this I, my diagram says that there is a semi permeable membrane here. Huh? And there is high potassium here. So when I am going ahead, what is going to happen to this potassium? It is going to reduce. Because water is coming from here which does not have anything, so it's going to reduce further. The gradient is going to be maintained all the time because there is fresh coming from here. You understand? There's fresh. You understand what I'm saying? There's fresh coming from here. Fresh that is so gradient is always going to be maintained irrespective of whether there is. So if I put just, uh, even if I have two here and this is one here, the gradient is still maintained. So when you go counter current, when you go counter current, more amount of solute actually diffuses inside because this is moving out after it gets into here it is moving out this is going in this is moving out of the filter since this is moving out of the filter whatever it is carrying over here is moving out right and whatever is coming inside is coming completely fresh clear uh, that's why you whenever you talk about any kind of modality when you say dialysis we actually count uh, call it as counter current mechanism it is counter to each other, the dialysate and this is counter to each other and what happens over here is after this occurs, this is then collected outside as an effluent. This word you should know. 
effluent. Okay, so any 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 machine will have something called as an effluent. Okay, and the effluent is what comes out at the end. So if it comes out from here, I would call it to be collected into a bag, which we call as effluent. So if I want to understand whether my machine is working well, I have to calculate my effluent. If I want to know whether my 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 therapy is working well, I calculate my effluent. Kitna nikal raha? Are you understanding? Huh? That's what effluent is all about. Clear about effluent? Huh? So understood diffusion. Diffusion, समझ में आया? You understood this diagram? Diffusion. So as you rightly put up, there is a pump. So let's put a patient somewhere here. Let's put a patient here. Sir. Huh? Regarding effluent, sir. Uh, yeah. What is removed is effluent switch. Ultra filtering. Also removed. Ultrafiltration also removed, no? Mm. At the end of the day, what is ultrafiltration? What you are moving out? What you are pulling out? What you are pulling out, right? So what you are pulling out is going into this bag. So whatever is pulling out is an effluent. Okay, so that's also part of your free treatment modality. For a scuff, your UF, your effluent will be your treatment. For a slow continuous ultrafiltration. So what is that? Diffusion. Huh? So if I put a patient on this now, and let me put a patient here. I'll put one. Uh, Patient here, okay, and I put an access over here, okay. So uh, my access goes from here, goes into this, huh? And my return fluid comes from here and goes into this. बराबर? वो उल्टा हो गया ही, हाँ? ठीक है, हाँ? तो उल्टा हो गया. And here I have one pump. This is my pump. So this is the pump that she's talking about. <coughs> Now the roller pump is very important. The roller pump is responsible for pulling in fluid and pushing in fluid. Both. The roller pump is responsible for pulling and pushing it through the filter. Okay, pushing it through the filter. So when you that is why you have a pressure that is shown over here, a pressure, a gauge that is shown over here. There is a pressure gauge shown over there. So in your machine, you should see what is coming from there and where is my pressure gauge coming from. You understand? Huh? So classically, that pressure gauge will be negative. Classically, because it's pulling fluid, uh, it will be negative. So how negative you can go? You cannot go too negative. Minus two eighty, I can't go. You know that's all. So it tells you that there is a problem in the axis here. Similarly, when it pushes ahead, there is another pressure here, which actually comes in over here. That's post pump pressure. It will actually tell whether this problem, there's a problem here. So by looking at these pressures, you have an idea of the problem here, the problem here, the problem here, the problem here. Are you understanding? Yes. Huh? Okay. So if the access is not good, then the lumen of the LD catheter is small. So that pressure will be... It will get more and more negative, no? So you have to figure out whether it is this pressure, whether it is this pressure or whether it is this pressure. So both the pressures, one is pulling, pushing, one is pulling. You understand now. It is important for you. That's why you must understand that you cannot just change the lumens. Are you understanding? Because if you just change the lumens, what are the problems that will occur? Diameter of the lumens. Diameter of the lumens is the same only. Huh? What is the difference? What is going to happen? This entire thing will change, no? To तुम्हारा प्रेशर जो मॉनिटर कर रहा है वही चेंज हो जाएगा आर्टरी वेन हो जाएगा वेन आर्टरी हो जाएगा क्लासिकली व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट दिस वी कॉल रेड द रेड वन टू बी एंड टू बी द कॉल्ड एस द एक्सेस रेड इज द एक्सेस यू नो ब्लू इज द रिटर्न यूजुअली रेड इज द एक्सेस एंड ब्लू इज द रिटर्न सो द एक्सेस यूजुअली अमंग इन द कैथेटर यू हैव लुमेंस वेयर डस द एक्सेस ओपन अप the axis opens up on the side so if you have if you have a lumen of your arterial of your line this is your dialysis cannula right huh so your axis will open here this will be the hole and your return will be here return this will be your axis this is very important why is this very important because classically what i want I want to take fresh blood from the body, and that is why I want to take my blood from here. 
whereas I want to give my return blood here. Are you understanding? I want my return blood to go back from here. Now, this is going to the heart. Ke andar, na? Both of them are going into the heart only, right? Both are going to the heart. But they are coming na, from SVC and IVC. They are coming from different parts, right? Huh? SVC and IVC is coming. I want the most dirty <coughs> blood, if I, if I would call it this way, to come from the top, no? Are you understanding? If I take, move this from here to here, I am actually reducing the efficiency. What I am filtering, I am taking back in. Are you understanding? Huh? What I am filtering, I am taking back in. That makes sense only, right? Huh? So this phenomenon that happens over here is called as access recirculation. It is called as access recirculation. So that is why, uh, as I told you in the last lecture also, the, the access has to be very, very good. If your access is not good and you do all these funny things of changing lumen, what happens at the end is the efficiency of the filter, the efficiency of the therapy goes down majorly. Access recirculation occurs. You are understanding? That is why I want to use the blue for the distal where I am going to return it back into the body. Whereas I want to use the red <coughs> for access. That means I want to draw the blood from there for my treatment modality. Are you understanding? So it's not a good practice to change that lumen. It does a lot of damage actually to the therapy. At the same time, it changes all my pressure. Such in your understanding? So in your understanding? So they do uh, change the lumen. It's so wrong, no. Then I have to do a lot of things, the jugglery after that, to adjust the therapy. After that, I have to do a lot of jugglery to adjust the therapy to improve the efficiency of the filter, to improve efficiency. I do a lot of changes after that. The moment you change it, I do a lot of changes. But it does make sense, you know. Why should I make all the changes when things should be done the right way? And you must understand that there will be access recirculation if how much of changes I do. So my therapy flow going on well, the next 24 hours is always back, the moment I do this. This is all the more reason that you must understand that I can't put another pair as jugular line there. That makes sense only. Uh, understand? If you put another jugular line from there, whatever antibiotic I am giving, whatever norad I am going to give, it's going to go from there, okay? You understand? It's, it's, it's useless to have a line and a, especially a triple lumen line to be right over there. Huh? Uh, or, or you have another left channel jugular going over here. It makes sense only. It makes sense only, especially in a continuous modality. In a continuous modality, that line is only for CRRT. That vein is only for CRRT. Don't use that vein for giving anotropes. Don't give that vein for giving antibiotics. Because what is going to happen is whatever you're going to give is going to get back into the system here. And half of your thing you're you're, you're you're giving antibiotics to your filter. You're giving antibiotic to your you know your effluent. Nothing is going inside the patient. So sir, so that way you left side. No, you should not. That is what I am trying to tell you. That's why every time I come and say, hey, hey, left side, I'll give Ask this question, right? Why do you ask this question? Then? No, I mean, so HD on right side and then we shift to the left side. So, HD left. is different. We are talking of CRRT. See, HD may is intermittent. Mm -hmm. HD is intermittent. HD may kya you are not on a continuous, you know, kind of filtration. HD may what you are doing, you are doing it intermittently. So, your antibiotics are going intermittently. It's not going at the time that the dialysis is occurring and it is foolish to give it at the time the dialysis is occurring if your lines are right here. Are you understanding? So classically nurses don't give it. <coughs> classically, if you, typically if you ask a nurse when he's going to give the antibiotic, she'll say I'll give it after dialysis. She says that because she knows it has been told to her, it is clear in her ki by need in I, ki reason being this, reason being this. You as doctors should understand the reason is this. Are you understanding? So in a CRRT, it doesn't make any sense. You have a right-sided uh, dialysis uh, line and a and a left-sided uh, you know a left-sided jugular line. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. You understand? So that is why when you have uh, CRRT, if you have a right-sided line, put a left-sided femoral line. Uh, that will make more sense because otherwise you are not optimizing anything. You are just antibiotic. You are giving it to the filter. Nothing more doing. Are you understanding? Huh? Clear on the access. That's why the access classically should be right internal jugular or right femoral. Right internal jugular, right femoral. Because they are a pretty not gen typically what happens, you already have a center line. Typically you already have a center line. So it is it's foolish to take the center line, put it over here and put it on here. It's better to put a femoral line. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Better put a femoral line because this is completely different from what you're giving over here. Sound direct? Huh? Come. You have understood this, right? Huh? So, in a intermittent hemodialysis, the water is coming from something called as an RO plant. In intermittent hemodialysis, the intermittent hemodialysis, when you have this intermittent hemodialysis happening over here, the water is coming from a pipe. Mm -hmm. 
that pipe has a auto plant outside our ICU. Okay, and that plant is maintained at a very high sterility level. Very high sterility level. In fact, there are weekly uh, cultures that are taken from there. Weekly it is reported to infection control. Weekly it is reported to ICU. I get an email from them saying this is the amount of E. coli or if there is any E. coli or something like that. Understanding. So that is the RO plant, which mm -hmm. is situated also. Every uh, Sunday there is a RO plant disinfection that occurs. You've seen that. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday there is a RO plant disinfection that occurs. So it's very highly. Uh, you have portable ROs also. There are a lot of portable ROs. So, for example, if you don't have the facility to build a very large uh, reverse osmotic uh, plant over there, uh, there are portable ROs also that are available in certain hospitals. Portable ROs. But what we use in CVVHDF is not that. A, or any kind of CRRT modality, we don't use the RO. We can't use the RO. We use solutions because we need to understand the balance because this machine is an AI machine. You understand the machine has got artificial intelligence which is telling us itna weight kam hua, itna weight jada hua, itna fluid andar gaya, itna fluid kam ho gaya. You are understanding because multiple machines are there. Of course, there are new CRRT machines that are slowly slowly coming which are actually using RO also. There are new ones that are coming which are actually using RO also but we have not really explored that as of now. It's maybe very very expensive because the AI will be on a different level there. You understand? So here the CRRT has got an AI which is requiring the weights to be seen, the weight understands is by weight of the solutions that are kept on the, on the, on the weighing scales. Okay? Hmm? So next is uh, CRRT, Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy. It is developed to overcome the deficiencies of ISD. Treatment occurs uh, 24 hours a day. Blood flow is usually 100 to 200 ml per minute. Dialysate flow is 15 to 40 ml per minute. The advantages are hemodynamically well tolerated, smaller change in plasma osmolality, better, better control of azotemia and electrolyte and acid base balance, correct abnormalities as they evolve steady state chemistries, highly effective in removing uh, fluid post surgery pulmonary edema and ARDS, facilitate the administration of parental nutrition and obligatory intravenous medication that is inotropic drugs. Uh, less effects on uh, intracranial pressure, new, new user friendly machines are also available. <coughs> Continuous venovenous uh, hemofiltration. So, uh, in this method. So, so, before we go into this, before we go into this, okay, before we go into this, I'll just put up something here. So, what I'll do is, I'm not going to put up, so you understood the access. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to put up a semi I'm going to put up uh, two kind of, I'm going to put a membrane here. I'm going to put like a division here and I'm going to put this as hemofiltration, this side and this side as hemodialysis. Okay, so we, you as a doctor should understand what is what. Okay, so now you understood what is hemodialysis. Dialysis is diffusion. And what did you understand by uh, hemofiltration? Convection. convection. Can you explain the concept what is convection? So convection is the fluid is uh, transported across the room under high pressure gradient. So, not pressure gradient. Uh, it is just fluid is moved mm -hmm. at a uh, uh, you know at a very faster rate with, uh, with from one place pressure. to another place. And what is happening there? Fluidation. Fluidity over what is the difference between ultra and convection then? What is the difference? What is the difference between ultra and convection? So ultra is removal of water. Huh? And convection? convection. So the removal of water. Along with so you could add to it, carries some amount of sodium. So let's go back to our semi-permeable membrane here. Okay, so um, I'll just take this off from here and put the semi-permeable membrane here. So that you must understand this again before she goes in there into this. Okay, so you have, I'm drawing a membrane. Okay, and I'm putting a semi-permeable membrane in place and I'm putting holes over here. Okay, I'm putting holes over here. So this is classically a semi-permeable membrane. Okay, when I'm saying ultra filtration, I am using hydrostatic, oncotic and osmotic uh, uh, force to actually move the water out from here. Huh? So there, where is this water going? It is getting collected into the effluent. Classically getting under this is ultra filtration. This is ultra filtration. So what is happening? The water is moving from this inside this, from this inside this. So, so from the Outside from the blood, it is moving through semi-permeable membrane pores into the effluent. Outside. Outside. Okay. So can it change the pH? No. It cannot change pH. It's not going to work for acidosis. 
can it change the electrolytes? Again, no. It may cause a little bit of dilution and concentration here and there, but otherwise, you know, it's about to move only the water. Okay, it's only moving the water, so no electrolyte disturbances. Nothing is going to happen. What is, what is going to change? Only the changes is in water. The only change that we are having is in water. So only change having what nothing more is going to happen. So that is why in pulmonary edema, if I want to do <coughs> fluid removal, this is a very simple method. Put on ultra filtration, lysic versus push me kaap kani, matlab nahi hai, jo fluid hai, bhaan nikal jayega. So where does this come here in the arm of filtration, what else is, where does this come? This side or this side? <coughs> Exactly such a thing. So your scuff is the modality that will come here. So it's the filtration part of the entire story. Hemofiltration. It's not hemodialysis. Slow continuous ultra filtration. Clear? But the difference is now if you put over here the blood, this is the blood compartment from where the water is coming out. This is the blood compartment, right? It's the blood compartment. Now let me put blood contains RBCs. Blood contains proteins. Huh? Blood contains small sodium, potassium. It contains different molecules. So I am showing small molecules, I am showing middle molecules, I am showing RBCs basically. Huh? So RBCs are not getting filtered from anywhere, just the water that is moving. But what happens with convection is that, for example, if we put a cytokine that is there, an interleukin 6 and interleukin 4 that is over here. Okay, this is interleukin 6, interleukin 4, cytokines are there here. Hmm? So what is happening with convection? What is happening with convection is that not only water is going with it, this is also moving through. This is also moving through. Same hole, this is also moving through. That means these middle molecules are also moving through. Okay, this is what's happening with convection. With convection, these small, medium, uh, middle, and large molecules are actually moving across the filter through the semi permeable membrane. This is convection. Clear? This is convection. Clear on this? There is no dialysate fluid. So, what over here? There is no dialysate fluid here. Here also, was a dialysate fluid is cuff? No. It was a ultra filter, it was a replacement fluid here? No. It was a filtration fluid? No. All that was what? Just a just a dialysate membrane and pressure, that's all. And flow, that's all. Right? When I say convection, what am I having? I'm having a filter. Am I having am I having uh, uh, <coughs> I, am I giving dialysate fluid here? No. But I know that when I'm actually filtering out so much of water and so much of molecules there is going to be drop in blood pressure so I need to give something more I need to give some amount of water more so that water is called as replacement fluid though it is not replacement fluid, it is not replacing anything it is not replacing anything huh? what is, though I am just calling it replacement fluid it is maintaining it it is maintaining it but more importantly if I increase my replacement fluid what is going to happen? no that's what. If I'm going to increase my replacement fluid in our body. So where does this classically go? So in, the, in this filter, in this filter, she's put this diagram here. So she's put two diagrams. What are the two, two things that we put over here? So both uh, hemofiltration and Come, come, explain, explain. Then we'll go ahead. Huh. Uh, this is continuous venous hemofiltration. In this, we are using the method of ultra uh, that, uh, convection. The principle is by convection and we are using pre and post uh, filter replacement fluids. Uh, so this is phenomenus hemofiltration. Then next is hemo No, so, so can we, you go back. So now let's go back. So now what she says, what she says is, you, this is the same filter that I am showing over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, you are saying that you are doing a CVBH, right? Now, as I told you, we are going to remove large amount of fluid. Huh? I am going to remove large amount of fluid. So I can give this, I have to give this fluid back. Okay, I want to give because it's a continuous therapy, it's not it's continuous therapy. Okay. If I'm removing fluid and I'm giving fluid back, the fluid is not replacement. What is the fluid doing actually? The fluid is actually going to increase the flow more. The fluid will increase the flow flow more. If the flow increases, what is going to improve? Um, dialysis Convection. Convection. So dialysis, we are not in dialysis yet, we are in convection. So if I would increase the flow, what is going to happen? Convection. Are you understanding? Yeah. Huh? So it, don't consider this and I am replacing what I am losing. No, it's not like that. Don't take it out from your mind. The therapy is improving when I am increasing my convection. The therapy is improving when I improve my convection. So if my convection goes higher, 
my conviction goes higher, my therapy is better. Now the problem is where to put this fluid. The problem is where to put this fluid. That is the big problem. Where to put this fluid? Okay. Now she has mentioned two things. Uh, pre and post. So it's pre what? Pre blood pump, pre filter. Pre filter or you know this or post. Pre filter or post, post filter. Right. So in this diagram, where can I replace the fluid? I can replace the fluid either here. Uh, or I can replace the fluid here. Right? I can either replace the filter, I can replace the uh, <coughs> water either here or I can replace the water here. So when I replace it here, it is called as pre filter. When I replace it here, it is called post filter. Okay? You can also call it pre blood pump and post blood pump. Because your pump is in the same, you can call whatever however you want to call it. Okay, so pre-filter replacement and post-filter replacement. Now there are certain problems with both of those. If I say pre-filter replacement, what could be the problem, Niharika? What could be the problem when I say pre-filter replacement? What what logically you feel could be the problem? Nikhil? More convection is happening, so there are chances of more solute and more fluid. Yes, one thing. Very good. So it can cause more. So if I if I want to actually give fluid there, it can cause more convection, right? Huh? So in a modality of CVVH, it is going to cause more convection. Second, what what else it can cause? Am I getting concerned? Am I doing diffusion here? So it's out of question. You. So you're right. What will that also cause? What will that also cause? It's going. What else can cause? What else can help in? So at the end of the day, it's a semi-permeable membrane. It's a semi-permeable membrane that has a very high chance of clotting. Now, with so much amount of flow, so much amount of flow, I will reduce my clotting here. No? Are you understanding? I will reduce my clotting here. So when I'm doing CVVH, when I'm doing CVVH, if I give pre-filter fluid. It may help to increase my convection and at the same time it will also help to reduce my clotting. Are you understanding? Huh? Are you understanding? It will help to reduce my clotting pre-filter. Clear on this? Huh? Even if I am giving it post-filter, my flow is going to increase only. It is not going to go into the blood only after all. You understand? But the clotting effect is normally here. That's why whenever you are going to see your, when you are going to see your machine, diagram when you see your uh, cassette they are going to put inside there will be one port here one port on top the second port and first port the first port is just before the filter where I tell the nurses you put water there I tell them not put, put normal saline attach it over there because I am helping the clot not to occur so so in CVVH where do I place it here or here yeah, you okay so let's place CVVH here so in CVVH what will I have to add here I just have to add a replacement fluid. So if I add a replacement fluid here, I'll add another pump here. Okay, I'll add another pump that comes from here from a bag that is basically coming from the replacement fluid. I'm just adding one pump. So whenever I add one more pump, there'll be more pressures that are coming from those particular areas. You understand? Huh? So replacement fluid ka mere pump dal diya mere beech. So ek aur pump. So replacement fluid going pre-filter in my in this case. Do I have to add anything more here? No, because I don't have anything more here. All I'm having is a filter. I'm having an effluent bag which is down, which is in bag. I'm having a replacement coming from the top that is going inside this. And I'm having a blood pump. I don't need anything more than this. Clear? Huh? This is CVVH. Huh? Clear? Yeah. So so, is my is my treatment effect is my The treatment effect I find by finding the effluent again. Sun Huh? So, how do we decide whether we use pre filter or post so, filter? So, we, uh, we are normally using pre filter because our, we want to keep the filter half life. Nothing is certain. We are all learning things, okay? Nothing is certain. So, we are using pre filter because we feel that probably we will be able to maintain it much longer. That's why we use a pre filter. Uh, that's the thinking of using pre filter. But we'll come to further when it becomes a little more complex and we'll understand more. Go ahead. So, so, uh, 
so with the replacement fluid, it will be, be obviously more. Yes, it will be more. So, uh, it will be more. Uh, it is going to be more, no? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the patient is getting dehydrated. Mm -hmm. It is only increasing convection. Are you understanding? It is increasing convection. So, next one is continuous veno venous hemodialysis. Here we are using the principle of uh, diffusion. So, that we will take the blood from the patient. Then it will go into the pump. So, here we are using dialysis solution and we will remove the effluent. So this is CVVHD, hemodialysis. So third one is uh, combination of both, continuous veno, venous. No, 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 let's go first. Now let's go. You are in, you are now in hemodialysis, right? Yeah. So let us go to this now. With your, where you want to do, what you want to do now here? You have, you have done CVVHD. Yes. You have CVVH. CV. Now what do you want to do? So uh, CVVHD means uh, we put dialysis solution. So, if, uh, so CVVHD means there is no filtration, first of all. Huh? Or dialysis, it's only dialysis. Mm -hmm. huh? So what will come out? Replacement fluids. Will come out. Yeah. Replacement fluid will come out. Mm -hmm. huh? There will be no replacement fluid. Mm -hmm. What will get added? Dialysis solution. Dialysis solution will get added. Mm -hmm. huh? The only difference is, instead of a replacement fluid coming in, I will have a dialysis fluid. And that dialysis fluid will have a, uh, will have a separate pump. A dialysis pump for it. Mm -hmm. So Huh? <coughs> running all this, running all this, there would be another pump over here, which is called as effluent pump. You understand? So that's why you have four pumps on your CRRT machine. One is pulling in fluid from the axis. Okay. The second is actually moving the dialysate. Third is moving the replacement. And fourth is moving the effluent. So now the four clumps on me, kya kya kida hai, ha? Go ahead now. Let's go to the next one. So if I want to place CVVHD, where do I place it? <coughs> so though it is called, it is called uh, uh, this. You you would actually call it CVVHD. So it's it's on this side. So if you put it in dialysis is here, among the replacement therapies. So it's a dialysis model. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Next is continuous veno venous hemodialysis filtration. Here we are using both. We are using the replacement fluids as well as dialysis solution. So it is combination of both. So in this modality, the principles uh, we will use both convection as well as diffusion. Yes. So now you place the pump for me. What you want to add on this? Now to complete the entire thing for CVHDF, what do you want to add? First, uh, the here we. We having that replacement fluid pump. So, RM, RM, pump now? Then dialysis solution. Then upper side dialysis solution. Yeah, dialysis uh -huh. dialysis pump. Pump will come. Uh -huh. And it will be a bag. Uh -huh. Put it in the bag. Here, when dialysis pump, replacement fluid pump. Uh -huh. Then when effluent pump. And a blood pump. Blood, and blood. So, you understood now? Huh? You understood now? Yes. Now, if you can you place where it will come on that hemofiltration, hemodialysis, where will that come? Mm -hmm. Center. So let it go across. Mm -hmm. You understand? Huh? So mm -hmm. now, now if you understand how the pumps are, now you understand all those four pumps that are there inside the body. You understand? You have understand all the four pumps that are there outside of that machine which actually helps to conduct hemofiltration, hemodialysis, hemofiltration or hemodiafiltration. So when you say continuous veno, veno venous hemodiafiltration, I have got, I, I can play with it whatever I want. I can increase my dialysis if I want the small molecules to come out. I can I can do what I want to with the CVVH. I can do what I, you, know, you understand what I can do. I can do what I want to do, I can do. You understand? Huh? So classically when you put pumps, you know, the pump uh, is usually somewhere between 100, 150 to 300 ml per minute. <coughs> This pump is classically under it, uh, the blood pump. Let's say blood pump, and let me put it over here. I don't see a blood pump there. Okay, ah, that pump. So this pump will be somewhere around in, in our circuit here. This pump will be somewhere around 100 to 300 ml per minute. Per minute, okay, per minute. Classical. Huh? Then this uh, replacement fluid pump will be classically somewhere around 160 to 100 ml per minute. Again, somewhere going to around. Uh, one liter per hour to two liters per hour. 
okay, one liter plus two liters per hour. Huh? Similarly, dialysis also will be one liter to two liters per hour. Okay, that is the approximate uh, pump uh, speed that you need to keep. You understand? Huh? Clear? And effluent pump and ultra filtrate can go up to 100 ml per minute. Ultra filtrate. You can give 100 ml per minute. 50 to 100 ml per minute. So you can give 2 liters an hour. 1 liter an hour is ultra filtrate. If you want to have 1 liter. So classically it is kept at, most of these pumps are kept at 1000, 1000. Simple to remember. And, and blood pump at 150 ml per minute. Right? Clear? Huh? And? You want to go ahead? Yes. Yeah. So slow continuous ultra filtration, as we have discussed this before, it is uh, used for volume control in overloaded pressure. It removes solvent only, and blood flow is around 50 to 200 ml per minute. Fluid removal is 300 to 500 ml per hour. Then, uh, so for the scuff, do you need an, uh, you do you need CRRT machine? You don't need it. You can just use your hemodialysis machine and attach it. कुछ है ही नहीं हमको क्या जरूरत है फिर रिप्लेस में क्या जरूरत है क्या नहीं है हमको खाली क्या जरूरत है खाली डिफ्यूजन का और जरूरत है अगर डिफ्यूजन बॉक्स में हीमोडायलिसिस सो आई डोंट नीड अ सीआरटी मशीन टू डू अ स्लो कंटीन्यूअस अल्ट्रा फिल्ट्रेशन आई जस्ट नीड टू अल्टर द प्लेटफॉर्म स्पीड दैट्स ऑल दैट आई रिक्वायर हां एनी क्वेरी स्टिल नो नीड टू यूज कंफर्मेशन कंटीन्यूअस फिल्ट्रेशन इट्स हार्ड टू जस्ट वेयर आर रिपोर्ट्स ऑफ फिल्ट्रेशन Hemo filtration, mm. but I need a filter, no? I need a semi-permeable membrane, no? Yes. That's why when I started, we started the lecture, we said intermittent hemodialysis. Say we can do diffusion as well as ultra filtration. Mm. This is what I mentioned, isn't it? So we will we will use a dialysis uh, in this, and we will just start. Yes. So I will not have the RO plant attached. I will not have the RO plant from where my replacement uh, dialysis fluid is coming. I'm not going to use that. All I'm going to use is the filter and the patient's blood. That's all. Patient's blood, filter, and I will keep my ultra filtrate because I'm increasing my hydrostatic pressure across the membrane to give me the fluid that's going to come out. Clear? So, so for an inter for a scuff, I don't need. So tomorrow if I have a patient who comes in with gross fluid overload and not responding to lastly, do a scuff immediately. Put in the line, do a scuff. You, you understand? So <coughs> classically, when uh, when we were actually doing uh, you know fluid resuscitations, and nowadays we are going from fluid resuscitation to actually fluid judicious administration. We are not really resuscitating patients. We are easing out our fluid re uh, resuscitation, whatever we used to do in the past. Okay. So initially, when we used to give a large amount of fluid and tons and tons of fluid, we used to end up doing scuff later on. We end up later on we used to do scuff because we are. We studied that it was stabilization, optimization, you know, I mean, uh, salvaged optimization, stabilization, and de resuscitation. So, our de resuscitation used to not only involve diuretic, it also involves scuff. Any phase of sepsis resuscitation involves salvage, optimization, stabilization, and de resuscitation. So, in that de resuscitation phase, scuff was a modality being used. Okay, so it was very simple. Patients on dialysis just start dialysis. Don't do dialysis, just do ultra filtration. Someone there? Huh? Here? Next is uh, SLED. It is slow, low efficiency daily dialysis. It is an extended form of intermittent hemodialysis. It is usually occurs, it takes 6 to 10 hours session length. The dialysis flow rate is usually 100 to 300 ml per minute with a low blood flow pump, speeds 200 ml per minute. This is basically a hybrid uh, technique of both. It uses both the ISD and CRRT. It causes excellent small molecule detoxification. The requirement of anticoagulant is reduced. Cardiovascular stability is as good as CRRT and decreased cost as compared to the CRRT. So, so the answer is, it is equal to CRRT. So it is not this way that this is better than the other. CRRT or SLED, both are equivalent. Uh, CRRT and SLED, both are equivalent. There is no, uh, uh, this will indicate that CRRT is better than SLED. There is nothing to indicate that says that CRRT is better than SLED. Okay, if you can do 6 to 8 hours of SLED in a patient, uh, uh, it is equivalent to a CRRT. The only thing is that problem is you may not be able to do that in many patients. Okay, it's a situation that you may be able to do in some, you may be not be able to do. So in the very grossly what I'm doing, unstable patient, security <coughs> becomes difficult. Uh, to do that sled becomes kind of difficult. You understand? But if you can do the sled, it is equivalent to that of the CRRT. Okay. 
So uh, here are the differences between IHG, SLED and CRRT. The blood flow rate is obviously the least in CRRT that is 150 to 250 ml per minute. In IHG it is uh, greater uh, 250 to 450 ml per minute. SLED it is intermittent 150 to 450 ml per minute. Then dialysate flow rate uh, IHG it is 500 to 800 ml per minute. SLED 100 to 300 ml per minute. And in CRRT it is 1 to 3 liter per hour for CVHD and CVHDF. Then uh, here the duration is intermittent hemodialysis, it is 3 to 5 hours. So the ultrafiltrate rate will be 1 to 3 liter for 3 to 5 hours. And in slate the duration is 6 to 12 hours. So the same ultrafiltrate will be removed in 6 to 12 hours, that is 1 to 4 liter. And uh, in CRRT the duration is continuous, 24 hours. So 1 to 3 liters of ultrafiltrate will be removed in 24 hours. So the frequency, uh, ISD is usually done 3 times in a week, SLED is 3 to 7 times per week and CRRT is continuous. Okay, Arushad, uh, this is the basic principle of CRRT, okay. There are a lot many more things that can come in CRRT as to how to determine the dose. So for today we will go with this much, okay, so that you understand this in your and register in your mind. As we go ahead, we will understand. Uh, we understand uh, how to dose a CRRT, okay, how do I alter the fluid balance, how do I alter potassium balance, how I ma manage sodium, how do I understand whether the efficiency is going on or not, whether the efficiency is getting better or not, we go, we go to that as time goes. You have yours, CRRT come? Yeah. 